Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Assalamu Alaikum. Welcome once again to Journalistic Writing. To tell you once again, my name is Imran Chaudhary and I'll take you through this journalistic writing course. In our last lecture, we talked about the importance of writing and what writing is, what writing needs, and what writing requires from you. And after this, we talked about the difference between speaking and writing. And there, we studied that speaking is uh, universal, whereas writing is not. We also saw that speaking or spoken language has lots of variations, whereas writing demands standard forms of grammar, syntax, and vocabulary. And then we saw that uh, speaking or spoken language is uh, mostly informal, repetitive, whereas writing or written language is uh, always formal and very compact. Then uh, we talked about, you know, smaller features, for example, in speaking, we, uh, you know, let's say we give uh, pauses and we give uh, intonations. In writing, we uh, give uh, punctuations. And uh, in spoken language, you know, we pronounce and in, you know, written, we, uh, uh, you know, spell. So this is how, you know, we see these things. Today, uh, uh, we, I, I would like to, you know, show you some more examples just to see that, you know, how spoken language and written language are different from each other. Let's take a look of uh, our first example. You can see there are two sentences. The first one, if I read it for you, his father runs 10 miles every day and is very healthy. Now, you can see very clearly that in this sentence, there are two clauses. Clause 1, his father runs 10 miles every day. And of course, it's a simple clause. And second clause, his father is very healthy. Now you can see that these two clauses are connected with the help of simple conjunction and. And we read the other day that in speaking, lots of simple sentences we use and we connect them with and and but. Now, if you take a look at the second sentence, you can see his father, who runs 10 miles every day, is very healthy. Now, if you see this sentence, then uh, there are again two clauses, but there's a little difference. Our major, or you can say independent clause, his father is very healthy, and then it's combined with one dependent clause who runs 10 miles every day. And we have put the dependent clause in between our independent clause because who runs 10 miles every day is the quality of that father or you can say his activity of that father. So the sentence goes, his father who runs 10 miles every day is very healthy. Now you can see the first sentence is of course speaking. The second sentence is writing. Let's take another look. It's slightly longer, and I can read it for you. All the guests at San Pietro seem to be on honeymoons, whether 1st, 2nd, or 25th. The crowd, primarily Italian, British, German, and American, was sophisticated and decidedly unsnobbish. There were even a few celebrities on view. A famous producer, his wife, and friends stopped by for dinner while the chartered yacht lay anchored in the harbor. Two well-known actors arrived the day we left. Another star was there, but for some reasons stayed in her room most of the time. Nobody asked for autographs probably too busy having their own good time. Now, in this uh, piece of writing, you can see that 
no repetition, words, you don't see any informal item, more compact, sentences are tightly connected with each other. And if you compare this piece of writing with your next one, then you can see a huge difference. Over here, you would feel that there are lots of sentences which are simple, loosely connected, Right, uh, this uh, piece is repetitive also, slightly informal, and very easily you can find out those features which make any piece spoken one. I read it for you. Hey Jane, Bob and I just got back from a fabulous honeymoon at a place in Italy. It is loaded with atmosphere, and everyone else seemed to be on a honeymoon also. I guessed some could have been on the 25th. People from all over Italy, England, Germany, even some of us from America. And no one was at all snobby. There were some famous people there too. A producer had his huge yacht, and he and his friends ate dinner at the hotel. And then there were movie stars. But you know, no one asked for autographs. I guess... We were all too busy doing our own things. Now, dear students, you see that there are very clear-cut differences uh, between speaking and writing. And that's why I was saying the other day, I mean, if you are good at spoken language, for example, or you're good at speaking, but that does not give you any guarantee that you will be equally good in written expression or writing. You've got to learn that. And the difference has to be very much clear. The difference between speaking and writing. Let me give you one more example. I, I'm sure you'd like that. Now, on your screen, you can see there are two pieces. And they are clearly marked as A and B. Let's first take a look of A. For the standard of building envisaged, Maximum of a 10% variation would, in our opinion, give a price level at which these standards could be attained within the contract period stated. Just one sentence. Words are very formal, no repetition, very compact. Now compare it with another piece and you would see that yes, there is the difference like between written and you know, spoken. Let me read it for you. We think that the standard of building we have in mind, see the difference, over there we have envisaged, and here we have in mind a 10% variation would give the sort of price, and over there we had price level, which would make these standards possible inside the contract period we have decided on. In the previous, I mean, under A, you can see contract period stated, and in the second one, you can see, decided on. So again, one more difference perhaps I should like to tell, that in A, which I call written piece, starting is impersonal. Whereas in the second one, the starting is we think that. So this is more what you say personal, starting from V, pronoun. So this is another difference that writing is at times impersonal, whereas speaking is most of the time very, very personal. Let me give you one more example. Let's uh, see example number one. You must keep it and show it if you are asked to. Now, in this sentence, see again two simple sentences, you know, connected with and, okay? And if you compare with the uh, second item, which is to be retained, and produced on request. Look, keep it, we are replacing with retain. Show it, we are replacing with produce. And then, what more we are doing is, we are putting two verbs together to make, you know, the verbs parallel in the sentence. And uh, if you ask to is, you know, on request. So the sentence goes that to be retained and produced on request. And this makes your sentence more compact, and there you are with the writing. The first one was speaking. See the second sentence, please. The information may be changed without warning. Second sentence. 
this information subject to be altered without prior notice. See the choice of words. See the formality of the sentences. See the compactness. The information may be into subject to be. Changed is into altered without warning, prior notice. See the difference? See the word choice? See the structure choice? Let's come down to the third example. Number three. If there is anything wrong with the machine, go back to the shop where you got it. Now, compare it with contact the supplier should you find any defect in the machine. Now, look at this. I mean, the first sentence, if is should. Compare if and should. And that makes second sentence more formal, rather very polite as well. And uh, anything wrong is look defect. Go back is contact. So this is how the word choice, very, very careful, very, very formal word choice. The last sentence. You must pay a deposit when you book and you won't get it back. And now, the second I give you is a non-refundable deposit. Now take a look at this. Non-refundable deposit. I mean, if you compare it with the previous one, you won't get it back. And here, non-refundable deposit. And uh, let me read it for you once again. A non-refundable deposit is to be paid at the time of reservation. And over there, booking and here, reservation. So this is how, dear students, writing and speaking both are different. And you really need to put in a lot of efforts, actually, traveling from speaking to writing. Speaking comes the natural way, and writing, I would say, does not come that natural way, though, of course, uh, through some practice, through some training, you know, through some hard work, of course, you can attain it. But be very careful that whenever you write, make sure that your writing it, your writing contains all the features which make that piece a writing, a written piece. No any item from the spoken one. Word choice is different. Structure choice is different. No room for repetition. No room for informality. No room for clock wheel, you know, items. And uh, no room for slang use and all. Here I um, I can uh, recall an interesting incident, you know, which once happened. And this is a very apt example for this uh, speaking and writing thing. At times, you know, uh, speaking, since like we, uh, we don't, you know, speak it that planned, okay, and that compact, and that formal. So at times, like, you know, speaking, you know, results into you know, embarrassment as well. I remember once I was, you know, going to my uh, office, and on my way, I uh, met uh, with the three penguins. They were just wildly moving, you know, on the high-speed, you know, road. Uh, I just passed by them, and then I realized, no, uh, I should rather, you know, take them uh, somewhere to the zoo. So what I did, you know, I... Uh, came back and uh, loaded them into my car and instead of going to my office, you know, I wheeled towards the zoo. Unfortunately, on my way to zoo, you know, my car turned flat and I was quite helpless the, as uh, there was some problem, you know, with my spare tire as well. But uh, perhaps uh, my starts were, you know, really with me that day. I was lucky enough that uh, when I, you know, saw my uh, friend also coming down the same way, I requested him that, uh, why don't you take these penguins to the zoo? And I gave him some thousand rupees. I had some sort of sense of, like, uh, you know, satisfaction that perhaps today I did something really good. So let's come back and uh, enjoy it over a cup of coffee. So I came back to the town and uh, I bought a cup of coffee and a few cookies and uh, started enjoying. And there about I spent, I spent, I mean, about uh, an hour or so. And all of a sudden, like, you know, my eyes turned wide when I saw my friend, along with those three penguins coming down the cafe. I rushed out and I asked him, excuse me, I gave you, you know, thousand rupees to take these penguins to the zoo. 
and uh, you are back in here again with him? He was slightly puzzled. He said, excuse me, I took these penguins to the zoo. They enjoyed there a lot. And I still have a few, you know, money saved. And I now going to take them to the cinema. So this is how, you know, uh, the like the, uh, you know, uh, we both, me and my friend, you know, ended up with embarrassments, you know. And uh, we really enjoyed that. And I always, like, enjoy it, you know, whenever, like, I recall. Anyway, this is all about our first topic speak uh, this uh, importance of good writing and all and uh, with this now we uh, switch over to our uh, today's uh, actual topic I mean lecture number two which is uh, qualities of uh, good writers and concerns Robert Stevenson once said that uh, writers are like jugglers Writers are like jugglers. Why? Because they keep several balls in the air all at once. Let's try to find out what are those several balls. The first ball is writer as a communicator. To understand this point, we need to first understand what is communicator or what is communication. My dear students, communication is actually the art of being understood. To put it another way, communication is the ability of one person to share his meanings or her meanings to another person. To give you a little more refined version of uh, communication, then communication is a process by which meanings are exchanged or shared through the common set of symbols. When I'm saying communication of process, so let's see different components of uh, this process. In communication process, the first agent is, we call it sender. Why we call sender? He is the one who has some ideas, who has some feelings, who has some thoughts, or who has something to share. And he wants to send. We call him sender. Uh, the quality or the qualification of a sender is that he has something to share. Okay? And then we have receiver on the other end, receiving end. What's receiver's job? His job is to receive whatever is sent by the sender and his job is to try. This is not solely his job to understand, try to understand if meanings will be, I mean, if uh, meanings in uh, sender's mind, meanings in receiver's mind are equal, message is understood. Please keep in mind, sending and receiving is not always equal. Words do not have meanings. Sentences do not have meanings. Language written on a piece of paper has no meanings. Then where are the meanings? Meanings are in your mind. If you talk about shared experiences, amount of shared experiences, if sender and receiver both are communicating with each other, and they are exchanging shared experiences, amount is towards higher, then of course the meanings will be very, very similar, understanding will be higher. If experiences, senders and receivers' experiences, which are being shared, they are not similar, they are not towards the higher, rather towards the lower side, they are not similar. What going to happen? Meanings taken out from will be dissimilar and understanding will be zero. So that is the relationship between sender and receiver, which are two very important components of, you know, communication process. Now, inside these two, we have some more components, very important. Of course, your message itself, all right? 
Another one is uh, channel. There is another one medium. I mean channel oral written. Medium, let's say it could be a telephone. It could be, uh, let's say, uh, an email thing. It could be a letter. It could be uh, a newspaper. It could be, uh, you know, let's uh, say it a mobile phone. Or it could be anything. So that's medium. And then there is one more element which we call uh, the element of feedback. Receiver's reaction. At times, receiver's reaction is cold. At times, it's warm. At times, it's neutral. Why these three? Just because of, I mean, the sharing of the meanings. If meanings are being shared, he'll be warm. If meanings are sort of shared, 50-50, of course, he'll be neutral. If meanings are not that way shared, of course, his feedback will be very cold, giving no idea to the sender to understand, actually, uh, whether... Uh, he was successful in his communication or not. After this, there is one more commonly ignored component, overlooked perhaps, if not ignored. That's uh, the element of context. So this makes, oh yeah, uh, there is one more, I shouldn't forget that. That is uh, the communication breakdowns, the barriers. Some visible, some invisible barriers, they're also very much there. So this is what actually the whole, you know, process is. Exactly the same way, writer and readers, they are also in, also, you know, having sort of the same process, sort of the same link, sort of the same connection with each other. Look, writer, as a matter of fact, is sitting in an environment. Now, that environment can be very regional or can be very global. That environment is uh, generating. I mean, sorry, first take it this way. That environment is rather affecting uh, the writer positively, negatively. Through this effect, actually, I should say, that different stimuli are, you know, generated in uh, writer's mind. Now, these stimuli actually, you know, activate or create a reason to communicate. So this is how writer gets ready to send something. The way like, you know, we saw in the process of communication, you know, that sender has something to send exactly the same way writers in some environment, regional or global, Okay? And environment affects them. And because of that effect, stimuli are generated. And that stimuli actually create a reason, uh, you know, fair reason uh, for the writer to talk. Now, what writer does then? Writer, you know, uh, analyzes these stimuli. And uh, after that analysis, what he, what he does, he develops a message to be sent. Once the message is finalized, I mean to say it's designed, the writer also becomes a sender. Now he's ready to send something. Okay? And then, you know, there are lots of other, you know, uh, uh, what to say, procedures to follow that... Uh, that language, that message actually has to be uh, dressed up in some uh, language. I mean, he is going to encode that message. Now, encoding, there is another now discussion, another debate actually, like encoding has to be, I mean, how? I mean, it has to be from the writer's point of view or it has to be from the reader's point of view. That is another discussion which uh, I'll, of course, discuss uh, a bit later. And then, you know, that writing is uh, wrapped up in some medium and then sent to the receiver. Uh, if you remember, in my last lecture, I said one difference between speaking and writing is the listener is right there in front of you. You can shake hand with him. You can say hello and hi. You can see his reactions there and then. I mean, he can you know, interrupt you. He can ask you questions. 
I mean, he can frown at. I mean, you can very much on the spot, you know, keep on fine tuning your message. Writer does not enjoy this facility. Writer's reader is I don't know where, frankly speaking. Writer's reader is not there in front of him. So what do you think? Now, do you tell me, of course, a uh, speaker has to also uh, very carefully design his message. So what do you think? How much care a writer requires to design his messages when he does not know where is his reader? And then again here, who is a reader? That's another you know discussion, of course. I'll discuss it with you step by step. So that I may not like, you know, mix up too many things. So this is how, you know, a writer as a communicator acts in the society. He may be a professional journalist or he may be a novice writer, but both act the same way. Yes, uh, time and space factor, you know, does matter, but both enjoy as like, you know, writers uh, uh, exactly the way, like, you know, principles, you know, which uh, are applicable, uh, I mean, principles of communication which are, like, you know, applicable onto uh, the speakers, exactly the same way. All principles of communication, you know, they directly, indirectly apply on writer. Why? Because he also is a communicator. All right. Now, let's move towards our uh, second point writer and his uh, personality. This is a uh, quite interesting one and uh, I would like to illustrate this point uh, with the help of uh, an incident which uh, Dr. William in his book on writing well quoted. Once Dr. William and uh, Dr. Brooke both were invited by uh, some uh, student newspaper editors and uh, reporters. Dr. William was invited uh, to, you know, speak about uh, writing as a vocation and Dr. Brooke uh, was invited to talk about writing as uh, an avocation. Uh, let me please tell you here that uh, writing as a vocation means, you know, writing as a profession and writing as an avocation means, you know, write, writing as a hobby. I mean, uh, professional and then, you know, you can say uh, part-time, you know, uh, this uh, activity. I mean, they were, of course, like uh, sitting in front of lots of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, student newspaper, you know, editors and journalists, and they were asking lots of questions. And of course, very, uh, you know, happily, you know, uh, these two uh, eminent and prolific writers were answering the questions. I would like to quote a few questions which uh, uh, will, you know, explain us that what actually I mean writer and his personality. The first question uh, went to Dr. Brooke. And the question was, Doctor, how is it like to be a writer? And he answered, well, it was a tremendous fun. I would come back from my hospital and would go straight to my yellow pad and would write my tensions away. The words would flow and it was easy. On the other hand, Dr. William said, well, writing to me wasn't easy, nor it was a fun, and words never flowed. Next, Dr. Brooke, the question went to, if it was important to rewrite, and Dr. Brooke said, absolutely not. Why? Because this is how, you know, writing should very naturally and in very original form should go to the readers. Let it all hang together. And uh, Dr. William said, excuse me, to me, essence, I believe, 
uh, I mean, uh, rewriting is the essence of writing, and all professional writers rewrite, and then they rewrite what they have rewritten. Then he, uh, Dr. William said, E.B. White was uh, actually known to rewrite his uh, writings eight to nine times. The third question was, what do you do when uh, things don't go straight? Dr. Brooks said, well, uh, stop doing your work, put it aside, you know, till uh, the day it would go better. And uh, Dr. William answered, that writing is uh, not an art, it's a craft. And if anybody, any craftsman, you know, runs away from his craft, he's going to be broke pretty soon. And then uh, they asked Dr. Brooke again that, at, I mean, if you feel depressed, you know, or slow or down, what you do? Answer was, you know, uh, go fishing, you know, take a walk, or go on hill station, and uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Williams' answer was that uh, if you are writing as, I mean, if writing is your job, then uh, you have to learn to do it the way you do your other jobs. And they asked Dr. Brooke a question that, you know, do you move in writer's circles? He said, oh, yeah, I enjoy it a lot, you know. I mean, I sit with other writers. I share my, like, uh, you know, my, my piece of work with them. Uh, and this is how, like, uh, you know, I enjoy doing it. And Dr. William said, well, you know, writers never, you know, meet with other writers. They, uh, you know, work in this solitary drudges. And last question was that, Dr. Brooke, do you use symbolism? Answer was, oh, I love doing it. And uh, Dr. William said, well, I run miles away from it. I try to be more and more concrete and more and more compact. Now, from this question and succession, there were lots of many other questions, actually. But from this question and succession, you know, you can see that, fine, there are, like, uh, lots of uh, principles. There are lots of rules and regulations for writers. But writer writing is not the, unless it comes, you know, out from that writer's personality, which at times acts as a wall. I mean, writers are also human beings. They do have likes and dislikes. You know, they do have choices. They do have attitudes. They do have moods, you know. At times, they don't feel like working. At times, yes, they are into very much it. And, of course, their writing is affected. So the first and foremost thing, I mean, after, you know, taking care of writer as communicators, that writers do have their personalities and writing has to come through the same wall. Let's take a look now. There are a lot more other factors, you know, which affect your writing. First of all, writer and the factors which can affect you or your writing include Number one, your age. It matters a lot because as you grow up in the scale of time and receptivity, your interests, your pastime, your likes and dislikes, your priorities, they do change. Your style, styles change. Second point, your experiences, they can be regional, they can be global, but they do affect a lot your writing. Your gender, another very important point, another very important factor which really affects man, woman, really affect your location. I mean, your whereabouts, where you're living, you are in some countryside, I mean, some village, or you are in some, you know, privileged area, it does affect. Your political beliefs matters a lot, affects your writing, your beliefs, your education, your parents and your peers, your friends, your religion. So all these factors 
which we saw, you know, affect you, your writing, even I would say your productivity. So this is how uh, we uh, saw that uh, writer, first of all, is a communicator. And that communication is not without his very own personality. Has to be very much there. Now, the third point, which is important here, if writers have personalities, exactly the same way, you know, readers also have their personalities. Let me give you a hypothetical situation. Let's see, there are, you know, two of us, you and I. We are sitting together across this very table. I'm on this side, you're sitting on the other side of this table. See, persons we are two, but personalities are six. How? Look here. I, the way I think, number one. I, the impression I'm, go I'm giving you to think, two. And number three, I, the real, exactly the same way, you sitting across the table, you, the way you think, number two, you, the impression you are giving me to think about you, and three, you, the real. Now see, we are two persons. We are having six possible, reasonably possible personalities. And that makes writer's job difficult to beat so many. Who to address? Should we address the one, the real you are? Or the one you want to be? Or the one through activities you, you know, exhibit what you are? Now, my dear students, it's writer's job to find out that very real you. I mean to say that very real reader. Communication. I'm using this word again and again because uh, as we've just seen, that writer, of course, fundamentally, first of all, is a communicator. So communication will be effective if it is between the two reals. Me and that very you. So this is how it will be, you know, effective. And it's not easy at times to find out or to discover that very you. That's possible after some uh, careful study, which of course I'll discuss with you, and some points which, uh, you know, you need to keep in mind as a writer. Then of course you can discover the very real. The way, you know, writers have, uh, uh, I mean, the way there were factors, you know, which were affecting, you know, writers' style, exactly the same way there are factors, you know, which read, which writers have to keep in mind about their readers. I mean, who they are writing for, exactly the same way, their age, their likes and dislikes, well, their education, their beliefs, their religion, uh, their whereabouts, their friends, the circle, their style, I mean lifestyle, the community they come from. So they are also affected by. So readers do have personalities and uh, writers. One very difficult task is to find out the real he, I mean, he here means the reader who will be reading that piece of writing. Now let's uh, move on to our next point. Very important point, which uh, writers have to keep in mind. And good writers, of course, do. I mean, I believe. Good writers are context-sensitive. What does it mean? Look. 
We all have contexts. Remember, I use the word environment. Writer is in an environment. Basically, that environment is the context. But this is half, actually, half truth. Reader has also got his environment. And this activity happens when writer and reader, their environments, you know, come on each other and there, like, you know, the whole stuff starts. So, good writers have to be very, very, very careful about the contexts in which they are going to work. We all have contexts. They are good, they are bad, they are happy, they are sad. And exactly the same way, they make us good, they make us bad, they make us happy, they make us sad. So this is how, like, you know, things happen. And you, as writer, got to be very, very careful about it. Now, look here. Fundamentally speaking, there are two types of contexts. And uh, let's call them uh, a context, non-sensitive, A, and B, a context, sensitive. What do I mean when I say context non-sensitive? Context non-sensitive means that, I mean, such an environment or such a situation in which or which does not make us uh, sad. Um, excuse me, don't forget I'm talking about non-sensitive. Non-sensitive context, a context which in which or which does not make us uh, sad or dismay us or uh, uh, disgruntle us. Now, take it this way. Non-sensitive context is a context when communication or writings or speaking, whatever, like, you know, communication is done through this context Readers, they will be intellectually engaged or stimulated. They will not be sad. They will not be dismayed. They will not be disgruntled. Same way, they will not be happy. They will not be overjoyed or ecstatic because it's very neutral thing you are not addressing their emotions you're only in addressing the mind tools you have some problem you're writing that out to your reader and you're giving him sort of a food of thought think over so you engage what you intellectually engage your readers this is one context and writers in such, and writers, you know, in uh, such context do not beat about the bush, actually. When they organize their uh, information, they don't beat about the bush. Why? Because, of course, it's not a work of emotions, you know. It's all intellect. Therefore, what? In the very opening paragraph, or in the very opening, they disclose what they want to say. And then onwards, you know, it's all details, sportive details or, you know, all, I mean, uh, you know, um, A to Z information, you know, which is needed, of course, they mentioned. But important thing is, in non-sensitive context, which engage readers intellectually, the organization of information is direct. Right there in the first paragraph, say what you want to say. Okay, now let's take a look at the second uh, context, which we call as sensitive context. To be very uh, straightforward, sensitive context is which involves or engages readers emotionally or 
you can say readers are emotionally engaged. I mean, that can be something, uh, I mean, the message can be sad, you know, or it can be uh, some sort of uh, persuasive message, uh, which is uh, negative persuasion. Well, you know, for this sort of context, you know, writers uh, do a little more care. They don't organize their information the way, uh, you know, non-sensitive. In, in the case of non-sensitive, here, writers adopt indirect, uh, you know, organization, indirect approach. They do not say right in the first paragraph what they want to say. Rather, they wait. They wait. They set the scene. Okay. They prepare their reader for something which is not intellectual, rather emotional, okay? So, what they start with some cushions. They start with some indirect, you know, uh, uh, you know, details. And slowly, 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 they bring, you know, the readers towards that emotional stuff. And this is how, you know, they organize their messages. So, writer has to be very, very, very careful about the contexts, are they non-sensitive? If non-sensitive, then in uh, direct. If they are sensitive, then uh, you know they are going to be indirect. Okay, to give you some uh, examples of uh, sensitive uh, situations or sensitive uh, contexts, take it this way: you are writing on uh, religious issues or matters. You are engaging yourself on such religious matters which are like uh, the discussion of which uh, is not considered that way, you know, healthy, in other words, you know, which are taboo, for example. You are, you know, uh, writing on uh, gender issues. You are um, discussing. Um, color, let's say, creed, let's say, you are, you know, writing on uh, minorities, for example, uh, and so on and you know, so forth. So these are some, you know, examples of uh, sensitive contexts, and we are supposed to be very, very careful about. And a good writer, of course, is, he is very, very uh, I, I mean, just a tactful when, uh, you know, he's talking about const, uh, sensitive, you know, situations. Now, let's see our next point. Our next point after context sensitivity is that good writers have the purposes very clear. They are not confused about. Because if they are confused, the readers going to be. So they're very, very clear about uh, the purposes. Let's take a look what purposes, you know, are possible for a writer. You can see on uh, the slide, the first purpose you can uh, see yourself to inform. Your purpose is, or your reason for writing is to inform. Second, to persuade. You want to change someone's viewpoint. Third one, to educate. Fourth one, to call to action. You want people to do something, or you want to invite their attention to something very serious or something neutral going on. Next one, to entertain. And the last one, to shock. Now, these are some of the purposes which writers you know, can uh, uh, write on. And, uh, of course, each and every purpose requires unique of its own sorts treatment, which professional writers know very well. So, this is how uh, uh, today, you know, we uh, talked about uh, 
a few uh, you know qualities of uh, good writers and uh, some concerns as well to give you a recapitulation we talked about first of all that writers are first of all communicators they have they follow all those principles of communication which any communicator follows the process of communication like from senders and receivers like you know uh, work writer exactly the same way writer and readers you know and then we uh, you know studied that writers and their personalities we you know saw that writers are not away or out from their personalities are very much part and parcel of the game the game of uh, you know uh, this uh, writing and through that you know interview i mean uh, that uh, interview which dr william in his book on, on writing well he quoted you know i tried to explain you know how writers you know products are affected by the personality and then we found out you know a few more you know points which affect uh, you know uh, writers and their writing the third point was uh, uh, you know uh, the study of context it's two different types sensitive and non sensitive and how these contexts you know affect the readers in different contexts you know how readers react the risk factors sensitive context you know, of course have high risk factors involved and non sensitives have of course low risk factors so how then writer you know uh, tactfully you know deals with these situations well my dear students in our next lecture we'll discuss a few more you know points about writers qualities and the concerns with this um, take care of yourself and uh, see you next time bye bye